Good evening. My name is Mary Watson, and I'm Executive Dean at the New School, and it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to um, welcome you here tonight to this amazing event, um, the inaugural lecture of the 2015 Henry Cohen Lecture Series, Public Policy in Action. Um, this lecture is sponsored by the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy at the New School, and the series will examine how public policy serves as a vehicle to advance economic and social inclusion in the context of our evolving democratic, economic, and political shifts in America. Tonight's lecture will be given by Van Jones, president of Dream Corps Unlimited, uh, and the title of the lecture is Rebuilding the Dream, Framing Civil Rights for the 21st Century. I welcome all of you, though, all those of you who are here live tonight, and also our, our sizable audience that's joining us via live stream. So, hello from live stream as well. Um, the New School has been in the business of rethinking education and examining the progressive agenda of shaping a new world since 1919. So, for nearly 100 years, we've been convening events like tonight's event to, um, to honor open education, to honor dialogue around. Uh, difficult topics to look at the most pressing issues that um, face the world in the various times that the New School has been in existence, and then to try to activate and agitate positive social change. So this is a very nice um, place to think about where we would launch this public policy lecture series here tonight at the New School. This uh, lecture tonight is part of a new course, Public Policy in Action, Advancing Social Equity in America. This course was developed by Michelle DePass, Dean of the Milano School, Derek Hamilton, Associate Professor of Economics and Urban Policy, and Juliet Ellis, who's a part-time lecturer at Milano, and they are here tonight uh, for this uh, inaugural lecture. It's also, <laughs> it's also done in, 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 uh, in connection with the uh, Center for New York City Affairs and the Tishman Center for the Environment, and I appreciate the shout out for your <laughs> colleagues. We'll have uh, 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 four additional lectures in 2015. Uh, the next will be on changing demographics and the economic imperative, then the role of the public sector in advancing economic inclusion, measuring and influencing public opinion, and then finally, the new civil rights agenda. So we invite you to use our hashtag for this event, hashtag policy for justice. We uh, invite you to, to comment, to tweet, to post photos, and to continue the dialogue. Uh, and then finally, I want to give thanks to Susan Halpern, who's uh, our donor, to thank her for her generosity. Unfortunately, Susan is not able to be here tonight, but is a long-term supporter of the Milano School and through a generous gift from the Uris Brothers Foundation that honors Milano's founding dean, Henry Cohen. The Henry Cohen pr professorship has been in existence since 1998. And funds from this endowment were used to, de to develop this course and to create this symposium this year. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Milano Dean and Michelle DePass. Good evening, welcome. Boy, I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time, for a year, so it's kind of amazing and heady that it's actually here. <sighs> okay, so. Welcome to tonight's Henry Cohen Lecture, and as De Executive Dean Mary Watson told you, it was an event conceived and executed by the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. At Milano, we pride ourselves on being above the fold and bringing critical analysis and debate to the events of the day. We invite you to join our discussion using hashtag policy for justice, Again, hashtag policy for justice. And tonight you'll also be hearing from Milano lecturer Juliet Ellis and Associate Professor Anna Baptista. You'll be treated to the real breadth and experience and expertise that exists here at Milano in terms of deep practice and scholarship as both have spent many years in the public sector working in community and economic development and environmental justice. Thank you to you both. But first, it's indeed my pleasure to introduce Van Jones, tonight's distinguished lecturer on public policy in action, advancing social justice in America. Van Jones is a political commentator, regularly appearing across the network's programming and special political coverage. Jones has founded and led four, four not-for-profit organizations engaged in social and environmental justice. These include the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, 
which promotes criminal justice reform. Color of Change, which works for racial fairness through its one million members. Green for All, which lifts people out of poverty through green job training and job creation. And Dream Corps Unlimited Rebuild the Dream, which promotes innovative policy solutions and helps train 100,000 low opportunity youth to become top level computer programmers and hashtag cut 50, which is working to cut the US prison population in half in the next 10 years. Now that's a bold one and I want that to happen. A Yale educated attorney, he's the author of two New York best selling books, The Green Collar Economy and Rebuild the Dream. The second book chronicles his journey as an environmental and human rights activist to becoming a White House advisor. In 2009, Jones worked as the Green Jobs Advisor to President Barack Obama. In this role, Jones helped lead the interagency process that oversaw the multi-billion dollar investment in skills training and jobs development within the environmental and green economy sectors. Jones has been honored with numerous awards and spotlighted on several lists of high achievers, including the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leader, Rolling Stone's 2012, 12 Leaders Who Gets Things Done, Times 2009, 100 Most Influential People in the World, and Roots 2014, the Root, the root 100. But hold on. This is the very public Van Jones that we all know. I want to take a moment to highlight the Van Jones that I know. <laughs> Van is not only an astute commentator, he never misses a communications opportunity. When I was at the Ford Foundation, he called to talk about what he saw as the real nexus of green jobs and the economic problems of young men of color and asked for what now seems a really small amount of money to tap the communications opportunity that green jobs, not jails, could bring. It was the best investment that I ever made as a program officer because in the next two years, the Green Job Act was signed into law by George W. Bush in 2007. Talk about an investment turnaround. The first piece of federal legislation to codify the term green jobs. Not only that, as someone who also wants to bolster our side in our nation's progressive economic and environmental agenda, I wanted to grow our troops every day. I would often visit the Ella Baker Center, marveling that Van could tap the younger generation over and over and over again. Bringing them in, training and working with them, and within months, they were leaders in the community. Still learning, but rapidly becoming someone who you can learn from. But all that was not enough. By the time Van and I made our way to Washington, D.C. to work for President Obama, he had founded two additional nonprofits. This is a man that does not rest on his laurels. How many people do you know that have created four not-for-profits, all which are still charging forth with their mission? History will look back at our Van Jones and his accomplishments and judge him to be one of the leading public figures of our generation. A true change agent, he started his career as an advocate for criminal justice and has deftly turned to environment, economic justice, and now technology. I've seen him bring even the staunchest opponent to his knees with his arguments and his charisma. And if you watch him on CNN, You've witnessed that yourself. So it's an honor to have him here with us tonight. Van, thank you for accepting our invitation to come speak at the New School tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my friend, the indomitable Van Jones.
Hello. Ain't she something? Give her a round of applause, one of our great heroes. Uh, well, first of all, Michelle, thank you for the grant. Uh, we was getting kind of low on funds. And uh, they said there was a young sister over at Ford that might hear our case. And um, came through many times. And, um, you know, it's amazing. Uh, most of you here um, are weird. <laughs> so, um, we have a lot in common. Uh, most of you could pretty much be doing anything else with your time and talent. Uh, most of you are trying to figure out some way to, to help people you don't know. Baffling and bewildering your parents. Uh, making Thanksgiving awkward. Uh, and it can sometimes feel futile, uh, especially when we have a year like we had last year. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think happened last year and what I think we can do this year. And then we're going to have a discussion about it. Is that cool? I think last year was a great year for problem identification. Uh, if you, see, I'm optimistic, man. I can put a spin on anything. If you was trying to identify some problems, last year was a great year for you. Uh, so, um, I think... Um, the challenge now is to make this be the year of solution identification. Uh, how do we identify solutions that'll get people as excited as the problems got people excited last year? And that's really our responsibility. Um, so I got a chance to speak at the uh, uh, Progressive Congressional Caucus uh, over the weekend. That's all the progressive Democrats. Uh, I'm a Democrat. Um, so. I was welcome. And they were frustrated and frustrating in that they were really having a difficult time trying to sort out their agenda going forward. And I got a chance to speak, and, I, and I'll share with you what I shared with them. Uh, I, I think it's relatively straightforward now. Uh, I think that what we have to do is to close prison doors, open doors of opportunity, into a new green economy. If you ask me what I think the agenda is going forward now, close prison doors, open doors of opportunity into a new green economy. And there's things that we can do this year to actually move the ball forward on all three. Why do I start with prison doors? You guys have heard this a thousand times. I'm like, I'll say it, and probably every other speaker is going to say it this year. Uh, you know, we have 5% of the world's population. What's the percentage of the world's prisons that we have? 25% of the world's prisoners. I'll say that again. The United States has 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners. That means one out of four people locked up anywhere on planet Earth are locked up right here in the so-called land of the free. That by itself would be reason for us to, to move, but it's worse than that the disproportionate impact on black folk, Latinos, po folk is a shame and a scandal. Um, you know, now, I'm not a part of the pro-crime lobby. We want to be clear about that. But you and I both know about 95% of your colleagues at this school are nonviolent drug offenders. I mean, not you. <laughs> but you got serious, serious criminals to your left and right. <laughs> but they're not going to prison. If they get 
real buck wild, they might go to rehab. I went to Yale for law school. Uh, they would drive past Yale, drive past Skull and Bones, where everybody knew they were in there doing cocaine, and drive five blocks away into New Haven. Anybody been to New Haven? All right, so that's, y'all, y'all, that's, that's the hoodie hood. <laughs> Folks from the hood don't go to New Haven. But they would drive past the campus five blocks away and get kids who were the same age, 18, 19 years old, doing fewer drugs because they had less money. They didn't take them to rehab. They took them to prison for seven years, 18 years. I've been out of law school 20 years. Some of them just coming back home on non-violent drug, non-violent drug offenses. The numbers are despicable. Uh, we now lock up more African Americans right now while we're sitting here. There are more African Americans locked up than were ever enslaved at any one point in the United States. You count up all the slaves in 1850, fewer people than we have black folk locked up right now, a million plus, mostly on nonviolent offenses. It's very, very difficult to move forward toward anything positive when you have this new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander says, hanging over a whole generation. Well, the good news is that's the bad news. What's the good news? That's problem identification. What's the solution? The solution is it took both. Here's a dirty secret, Michelle. Nobody wants to talk about. It took both political parties to build the incarceration industry that we have. Both political parties went hog wilds in the 90s. Three strikes and you're out. Bill Clinton came into office a million people behind bars. Bill Clinton left two million behind bars. A doubling of the prison population under a Democratic president. I was in California, Gray Davis, you know, a mass incarcerator, Democratic governor. So it took both political parties to build the thing it's going to take both political parties to roll it back. And guess what? It turns out, here's your good news, there are people on the right who now agree. You say, what? Maybe Van's a nonviolent drug offender. (laughs) He must be on something. I was hopeless when I got here. Now it's terrible. Google it. Rick Perry just pushed through criminal justice reform in Texas. Mississippi, Republican everything. (laughs) Just pushed forward massive criminal justice reform in Mississippi. Why? Very simple. Fiscal conservative red state governors don't want to have to raise taxes to build more prisons. You know, think about that. It's like, that. what do I hate more, you know? <laughs> Them or taxes? I love you guys. <laughs> That's not fair, but it's funny. No, like... At a certain point, I was on TV with a guy named Newt Gingrich. We had a show together for a year called Crossfire. Newt and I didn't agree on anything. Like, there was not one thing we agreed on for a whole year. It's true. But on this issue, Newt Gingrich said, man, you don't understand. As a conservative, I have to look at this as a big failed government bureaucracy that gets bigger every year by doing a terrible job. It says corrections. What are they correcting? In fact, this big failed government bureaucracy, if it sends a guy home on Friday and he or she comes back on Monday with two of their best friends, Nobody gets fired. 
they get a bigger budget. He says, so I, <laughs> you know, you may have missed this, but conservatives are increasingly concerned about this level of government dysfunction. So I started looking around, and sure enough, Rand Paul, from a different point of view, libertarian, says, I don't want all these prisons because I don't want the government having that much power. He's quoting Michelle Alexander. Rand Paul quoted Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow on the Floor of the U.S. Senate. Goes beyond that. You got evangelicals who are saying now, white evangelicals, who we don't agree with on choice, don't agree with on marriage, don't agree with on very much, but they're saying now, hey, this isn't Christian values. This isn't family values. You take some young person, makes a mistake, away from their mom, away from their dad, put them someplace to be brutalized. And then you send them home, they can never get a job. They can never vote. They can never come back home. That's not family values. That's not redemption. That's not second chances. It has nothing to do with Christianity. This is coming from people like Mike Huckabee. Sometimes things get so stupid and horrible that even our Republican friends can see. <laughs> so what are we doing? My organization, I work with an organization called uh, the Dream Corps. We have an initiative called Cut 50. It's an initiative to cut the prison population in half in 10 years, being both bold and bipartisan, using stuff that's working in the red states. They got red state solutions. If you had them across the country, you'd bring the population in prisons by, down by 30%, sometimes more. That's solution identification. But what does it require? It requires us to do stuff we're not comfortable with. I, I did a congressional briefing Two in the last three weeks. Last three weeks, Simone? Yeah, two in the last three weeks. One of them was me, Newt Gingrich, Cory Booker, Tulsi Gabbard, and somebody, a right-winger from Right on Crime. It was like Beatlemania. Like, people just came to see. They just, just wanted to, <laughs> what is this? The next week, it was me, Sensenbrenner, uh, the Cope brothers. <laughs> Somebody hissing? <laughs> My junior discussion was hissing? I tell you what, I'll fight them all day long on environmental stuff. Cause they, they're dead wrong on that. But on criminal justice stuff, they're like, hey, we're libertarians. We don't believe the government should have all this power. I almost felt, I was like, what? Because, see, the whole time he was talking, I had my, my pen, you know. I'm, I spent a lot of time in Oakland. I was ready for him. He had my pen in my hand, you know. If he said, if he gets that too, too crazy, I was going to take him out. I'm like, <laughs> Start taking notes. I was like, where have you been all my life, you know? <laughs> Close the prison doors. It can be done. We just have to be willing to get outside our comfort zone and recognize the Democrats ain't been right on the issue either. Open doors of opportunity. Uh, that's Simone Sneed right there. Simone, wave your hand around. Everybody give her a big round of applause. I'll tell you why later. That's Simone Sneed. Um, Simone and I work together this uh, Dream Corps thing. We got another initiative called Yes We Code. Yes, we code. Not yes, we can. We already did that twice. <laughs> it worked out all right. Yes, we code. What's, what's that? We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to build the United Negro College Fund equivalent for computer coding education. Now, some of y'all are young. The United Negro College Fund. <laughs> a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, is a place you can send your money. You may not know Lane College, the little historically black college in, that my mother went to or my father went to or my grandmother went to or my grandfather went to. You may not know about Lane College, but you know you can send your money to the United Negro College Fund and they'll get those scholarships to those black students at those black schools and you'll be able to have success that way. But we don't have anything like that for African Americans, for Latinos, for Native Americans, women or men. 
who want to get into computing. And so we're building this thing called Yes We Code. The goal is to get 100,000 African American, Latino, Native American men and women age 18 to 30 trained to be the best computer coders in the world. Now, why are we doing that? We're doing that because uh, the Department of Labor put out a report. And the report said, to our shock and bewilderment, that the US tech sector, Silicon Valley and them, right? You know, you got Silicon Valley's from Austin to Boston. But the whole tech sector, they ran the numbers. The Department of Labor said, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second, wait, 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 wait. We got some of the most important com companies in the world, Google, Facebook, et cetera. You put them all together. Hold on a second. We're going to be short by one million tech workers in eight years. A million workers short. In other words, they're going to need 1.4 million. You take the MITs, the Caltechs, the Stanfords, all the fancy schools, you put them all together, they're only going to train about 400,000. A million, nobody knows where they're going to come from. I said, this is the best news I've ever heard. <laughs> if you care about po folk and brown folk and other left out folk, when you hear about a labor shortage, you get happy. <laughs> That's why Michelle and I worked on the green job stuff. We were pushing through so many policies to get the solar industry going, to get the, and, and they didn't have no workers. So you have tax policy in place to put up solar panels in California. You had uh, consumer demand for solar panels in California. You had uh, 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 employers, uh, products, and nobody to put up the panels. So people would order solar panels. They'd wait six months to get them put up, nine months. Why? No workers. I'm like, we got people who could do that. The most important work that needs to be done is to solarize America, and we got people who need work. So we put together that Green Jobs Corps and got people trained to do the work. So whenever I see a labor shortage, I get happy. Because the only time you're going to get anywhere trying to get some Poland and brown folk anywhere is when there's, when there's not enough white folk. <laughs> you waiting for white folk to get you their job. It ain't happening. They might donate. <laughs> so, so I said, look, this is a big opportunity. So we started looking into it. Well, hold on a second. Starting coders make $70,000 a year, starting out. So, well, of course you should make $70,000 a year. You got to go to MIT to get the job. Nope. You go, to, you go to Silicon Valley, they don't tell you what college they graduated from. They tell you what college they dropped out of. Now, as a middle class Negro, that's hard to hear. Yeah, I dropped out of Stanford because I'm trying to drop out. <laughs> That's like literally a capital offense in black America. <laughs> you don't see no black people dropped out because they get killed by their mama if they dropped out. It's, you've never, it's a null set. It's just, no, you got in, you're going to finish. It might take you eight years, you're going to finish. So, <laughs> so, I, I, so I missed a memo. I said, you mean you can just drop out of school, don't even finish high school? Said, no, it's a trade. If you know how to do it, they hire you. I said, well, how do you learn? They said, they have these boot camps where folks who barely knew how to check their email can go, but if you're mathematically literate, do a little bit of algebra. That's not everybody, but it's a lot of people. And if you're job ready, that's not everybody, but it's a lot of people. Then within three to six months, you can be trained to go from I can barely check my email to I'm an entry-level computer coder making 70K. I said, nobody ever told any black person this ever. <laughs> Never, not once. In the history of negritude. <laughs> so I said, this is awesome. And they said, well, of course. You know, people are very encouraging to you when you try to help po folk. Well, Van, I just think it's so noble. <laughs> what you're trying to do. And I just hope those, those, those urban youth 
we'll listen to you. Meaning, you know them Negroes can't do this work. <laughs> and don't want to. And there got a little bit of a point in the following respect. You go talk to most African Americans, especially young folk, they're trying to be Jay-Z or LeBron or something like that. And so we had a very interesting set of conversation with these young folk, and I love it. Um, I've gotten very good at getting their attention and getting them to want to be a part of this. It's very simple. You guys ever met any young people of color? Those of you who are not? Okay. <laughs> you might think it'd be very difficult to get them interested in computer science. It's not. Here's how I do it. I said, okay, how many of you guys have one of these? And they all raised their hand. They're really proud. I said, I've got an iPhone uh, 2. Uh, <laughs> I got iPhone 6. I'm like, oh, okay. I got like an iPhone one and a half. Um, I said, let me ask you guys a question. I said, I'm out, of, I'm out of it. I'm old, dude. How many of you guys have ever uh, downloaded an app? Right. No. Right. It's just proud. I said, okay, last question, last question. How many of you guys have ever uploaded one? Who's ever uploaded one? No hands go up. Because you're suckers. Because you're suckers. When you download somebody else's app, you make money for people that you don't even know just by moving your thumbs around. You make money for yourself, your family, your community when you upload an app and somebody else uses it. Nobody's ever told you that. You're sitting here moving your thumbs around, making money for people you don't know. We've been doing that for a long time. Moving our thumbs around, making money for people. We used to call that picking cotton. Nothing wrong with it. But you deserve to be more than digital cotton pickers in the information age. You should be uploaders, not downloaders. Now, if you want to be an uploader, you can start off making 70K within six months twice as much as your school teachers start out with in six months. You're talking about LeBron James. Mark Zuckerberg can buy LeBron James 10 times and not know it. You're talking about LeBron James. I love Le LeBron and all, all of them. But I'll tell you this, you got a million black kids out here playing basketball every weekend, trying to get in the NBA. The NBA is gonna hire 15 kids a year. I'm telling you, you got a million tech jobs about to open up. If we're not careful, we'll just have 15 little black Urkels <laughs> ready for a million jobs and a million black kids ready for 15 jobs. Now, I don't care what you say, that's not Officer Darren Wilson's fault. You win when you put maximum effort against maximum opportunity. You lose when you put maximum effort against minimum opportunity. Don't show me your rap, show me your app. You wanna impress me. Cause even the record labels ain't making no money no more. So we're doing Yes We Code. This year, we can push money to community colleges to start this new trade. You don't. Look, if you want to go to college, we should make sure it's possible. But it used to be, am I wrong? Am I wrong, Mr. Economist? Didn't it used to be that you could get a good, well-paying job without a college degree when we had manufacturing, when we had those skilled trade jobs? Absolutely, but I tell you what, he says, he says, he says, he, says, he, says, he, he made the brilliant point that there was still racism, which I appreciate. But... <laughs> But there was a time in the industrial economy where you could have trade jobs. You could learn a trade and be able to feed your family. In the information economy, there should be the same thing. So that's solution identification. So we're working with 
the top five boot camps teaching these folks. We're working with Google. We're working with Facebook. We're working with dozens of grassroots organizations that are already teaching coding, but don't have the opportunity to get the visibility and support to support their graduates on all the way down the pipeline. We're working with uh, MSNBC uh, to get the word out, working with BET to get the word out, working with the White House, working with a rock star named Prince, an actor named Chris Tucker. Because we're serious about getting 100,000 of our, we say we want a million jobs, we want 10%. 10%. And MIT can't fix this problem. MIT has not graduated a million people ever, total. <laughs> we can fix it. Last thing, into a new green economy. Look, the biggest march, people, oh, well, you know, that, that climate thing, that sure was interesting, like back a gazillion years ago. First of all, Give yourselves a round of applause for being one of the schools, one of the first schools to completely divest from these horrible pollution-based companies. <laughs> including my new friends, the Koch brothers. They don't deserve your money. Uh, no school should invest in any company, company that's going to destroy your future. Schools should be about building for the future and preparing a better future. So first of all, one of the biggest movements on the campuses right now, right beside Black Lives Matter, is the movement to get these, uh, uh, to, for us to stop investing in things that are gonna kill off any possibility of you guys having a livable planet, number one. Number two, the biggest march, the biggest demonstration since the second Iraq war was this climate march you guys had here uh, in New York City four or five months ago. The biggest march, period, but all these issues. You take every issue we're talking about, there's not been a march as big as that one since the war. So the political elite may not want to deal with it, or maybe cowed, but the people can look around and say, the weather's kind of wacky. I mean, just regular people are like, mm, this weather's wacky. Something wrong. And based off of that, you can get something done. What can you get done? Look, Juliet, Juliet Ellis, by the way, stand up again, Juliet, if you haven't. That's, that's, my, that's my friend. Stand up. Give her a round of applause. She's one of our great leaders. And she's coming up anyway. She, exactly. Exactly. She, she's going to come up here and take the microphone from me, which is very hard to do. Um, exactly. Come up here and let, let, me, let me brag on California real quick, and then I'll give you the microphone. I said close prison doors which we can do with a left-right alliance this year, begin that process. I said open doors of opportunity, focus culturally and practically on getting our genius kids on track with the jobs of tomorrow. We can do that this year. Last thing I said is into a new green economy. We got our butts kicked. Then we, Michelle? When we tried to get cap and trade passed through this wonderful federal government. And they said th three things that were very hard to refute. They said, if you try to move this cap and trade bill to, for, to, to stop global warming, to push clean energy, you're going to do three things. You're going to make everybody's energy bills go through the roof. They said you're going to decimate poor people in particular. And they said you won't even bring carbon down. The whole thing will just be a big waste of time. So we lost in D.C., we didn't lose in California. In California, we have cap and trade. At the state and local level, we have cap and trade. What's happened in California? Number one, energy bills are flat. Interesting. Number two, carbon is coming down on a per capita basis. Interesting. And number three, a quarter out of every dollar that we take from the polluters we give directly to poor communities. What does that mean? That means we have a quarter billion dollar fund a year, every year, forever, money taken from polluters, given to poor folks for mass transit. Money taken from polluters, given to poor folk for uh, weatherization of homes, green jobs, urban forest, et cetera. Every year, 
a quarter billion dollars forever. Why? Because in that green movement, labor, people of color, women, anti-poverty groups were at the center of the conversation and designed a policy to uplift everybody so we could protect the planet and the people. So that could be done in 49 other states and you'd have a big pot of money to deal with some of these issues, including the issue of closing prison doors and open doors of opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Van. So you're gonna sit to the right. I'm gonna invite um, Anna Batista, who's the next discussant. But really quickly, I'm Juliet Ellis, and I am one of the co-faculty uh, for this policy and action class. And want to, again, thank Van. We, when we thought about this class in particular, really wanted to um, bring to New School this opportunity to really engage with different practitioners from throughout the country that have been doing this work for a really long time, but that whole question about which, which levers actually work, and I think this conversation tonight will be um, really interesting because I had the chance, you've got Van who's done work from the outside, inside, every way, which, every direction that you could think of, and then I had the great privilege to meet Anna this morning. We had a chance to talk on the phone last week, and uh, Dean DePass had recommended her for this conversation and said, you know, I recruited this amazing junior, junior faculty member this year. And when I spoke with Anna this morning, she's like, I know Michelle from way back. Mm -hmm. She's like, I used to be at her door, pounding at her door around environmental justice issues when Michelle was doing work in New, Jer New Jersey. And I was like, oh my gosh, we've come full circle. She's come back into the fold at New School. But what's great about Anna is that she... Um, is really based in Newark. She's been doing environmental justice work, community development work, urban planning work, um, and really brings that practitioner on the ground, suing folks, fighting folks in the fight for change. And I think um, the practicality that she's gonna bring to New School is just phenomenal. And so excited to have her on this panel today. So we're gonna let, before we clap for Anna. Anna's gonna um, both respond to some of the points that Van made and talk about kind of where she sees the work going around environmental justice, community development, urban planning, as we think about kind of the new civil rights um, agenda. And then we will, uh, I'll facilitate a couple of questions, but I'm gonna actually cut them short to make sure that there's enough time for Q&A with this group. So, um, Anna, it's all yours, thank you. Hello. Thank you, thank you, Juliet, and uh, thank you, Dean Paz and Professor Hamilton, for inviting me to be a discussant with uh, with Van. Um, we haven't met informally yet, but uh, Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to, I wasn't sure whether to rejoice or to be very nervous about going after such an eloquent speaker. But um, I'm very happy and humbled to to be here and to be with you as a discussant. And since I'm now in the hallowed halls of academia, uh, <laughs> I have a the privilege of dwelling a little bit deeper into the, the problem part of it, right? We, we get to spend a lot of time in academia talking about the problem, and I think it bears um, a lot of reflection to think a little bit more deeply about the problem identification part of what we've seen this year. Um, because sometimes we risk misdiagnosis of the solution if we don't fully understand the problem. Oh, let me go. Is that better? Sorry about that. Um, so I was just saying I'm going to dwell on the problems because that's what academics do best. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, and then talk, you know, respond a little bit to what some of the thoughts that, that Van gave. Um, certainly in the last year with um, everything that happened in Ferguson and here in New York, um, the words, I can't breathe, those words resonated with so many of us in the EJ movement because of the many meanings that, that that saying, I can't breathe, takes on. In that expression, you know, we feel and we see uh, the roots of institutionalized racism that express themselves in so many different ways in our communities. And it reminds me all the time that environmental justice is not possible without racial justice. Um, and the movement for environmental justice that is owes oh, so much to the civil rights movement, um, has at its core this analysis of institutionalized racism that's so important uh, 
for the broader society to reflect on and to think about deeply about how we, we continue to tackle that problem because you know, we often focus on the acute manifestations of that kind of racism, the, the police brutality and the violence that we see in communities of color. And what often goes unnoticed is the slow violence that every day presses down on our communities, uh, that exposes our communities to disproportionate burdens of all different kinds, including environmental burdens and the air we breathe. And it's, uh, it's interesting because we do get siloed in our issues. You know, in the EJ world, we're, you know, we're, we're focused on cumulative impacts, multiple pollution from multiple sources, and how our communities are so overexposed, but we forget sometimes, or we lose sight of, the underlying trauma of the frustrations and the, and the fears um, and all that comes with being in communities under siege. And all of that, all of that is cumulative impacts. Um, so that's, you know, the question that I have is how do we get at the acute and the chronic, the symptoms of this disease, this uh, institutional racism. And like you said, the first step to solving a problem is acknowledging it. But I often fear that we don't fully acknowledge that problem in the, in, the, in the full way that racism plays out in our society because we don't like to talk about race. Um, and particularly in this post-racial world, you know, everybody's talking about we have the first black president, you know, we don't need the Voting Rights Act, we don't need affirmative action, we don't need environmental justice laws, um, you know. And the, the, the vision of racism is still these intentional explicit acts. And in the EJ world, we, we deal with this too. You know, we're fighting in court to prove that the incinerator came intentionally to pollute us, you know? And you can't prove that. Not anymore, not today. Those acts um, are discriminatory in their outcome. Um, and we see that across many different sectors, health, education. So, you know, I still find that race is the most useful lens to shine light on this liberal American notion that everybody's created equally and we're all treated fairly and what's the problem? Because the reality of the outcomes challenge that ideal every day in so many different ways in so many different sectors. And I want to remind, uh, and I know I don't have to tell this audience, but I'm talking to you white people. <laughs> um, the many different forms that, that racism can take. Um, the subtle, the unconscious, and the forms like white privilege that often go unproblematized and unspoken about. Whiteness rarely speaks its name. And of course it expresses itself in many of the policies that play out in criminalization of our young people, in health disparities and environmental disparities and employment disparities. So I still feel today just as strongly, especially in the wake of Ferguson, that we need to tackle head on this issue of institutionalized racism. And we are still united in this fight, that this myth that race is no longer the, a problem. And I have great hope for that fight because I saw, and I was with so many young people in Newark and in New York City and all around the country um, protesting what happened in Ferguson, protesting the Keystone XL pipeline, fracking, climate justice. Uh, there's so much energy, especially with young people, that we are not going to sit idly by watching sacrifice zones be created, right? Pushing America's dirty little secrets about pollution, police brutality, prisons, blight, pushing all of that to the margins, feigning ignorance, and worse, culpability, our own culpability in the creation of those places. And when I saw so many people on the street so angry and frustrated, you know, here's a moment, you know, to tackle this issues head on and say we're not going to accept this reality, these reality of outcomes. So, Enough about the problems, right? We, we know it's race, it's a problem, why not? <laughs> we got it. <laughs> do, do, do you feel like racism might also be a part of this? <laughs> I'm just joking, go ahead. Did you? I you hope you're ready. On that. Did you? Did you? Because I'm changing my questions based on your comments. <laughs> 
So, you know, I, I mean, I still have this notion that, you know, we, yes, we need to set a course for the vision, not just, you know, spend all of our energy fighting the things we don't want, because, you know, we do that a lot, and we do it mostly out of necessity in the EJ movement. You know, we have to continually fight the, the onslaught of disproportionate impacts, but we also have to set a hopeful path and a vision for what we want, and Van does that so beautifully and so, so wonderfully, so that's very important for us and for especially young people to see that there's hope in a future for them. Um, and I still believe in explicit um, policies that attack racial disparities and outcome, you know, that tackle enforcement of Fair Housing Act, that tackle, you know, enforcement uh, of access and investment in, in communities of color. Um, you know, cap and trade is a great example. You mentioned cap and trade in California. You know, the, some of the cap and trade proposals that, for example, the one in New Jersey that our illustrious Chris Christie put <laughs> into place, uh, completely left out the, the discussion of inequality and race and dis disparate impact and disparate outcomes. And I, so I, the idea <laughs> was to take all that funding and just put it into the general fund. Exactly. And continue to burden the communities that always get burdened and benefit the larger, to the benefit of the larger society. And so it's, worse, it's worse than that, too, because now uh, in Oregon, they want to follow that same stupid way. And, but the, the reason why we, the way we did in California was right, not only was it more economically effective, more ecologically effective, it's more politically durable because then everybody's got a stake. Some funding in the, yeah. in, in the state. And, and we've been making that case that, you yeah. know, um, and it, you know, so I think that we still need that explicit part of this this process, and yep. and I know you're working on the the right left coalition with my friend Cory Booker, but I I still am fighting for the left left coalition. <laughs> Good um, luck with that one. The left, the left, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. Ninety percent of my therapy <laughs> comes from being in coalitions <laughs> with progressives. <laughs> It's possible. I have hope. I have hope, and you know, I, I saw a glimpse of what that could look like in the People's Climate Action because you know I, I really did see the coming together of, of interests of labor, immigrant, young people, peace, climate movements. You know, really align themselves and privilege. They privilege the voice of the frontline communities, of the native communities, of the most impacted, but also. Sis raising those people um, that were doing the hard work. You know what's so terrible about that, though? It was terrible. I showed up at the climate march. Uh -oh. exactly. I, Sorry, did they put Dana. you in the wrong sector? Did they uh, no, I showed up at the, the climate march. <laughs> and, you know, they, I was in the Were you front. with Leonardo DiCaprio? And so, yeah, so it was like me and, and, and Leo and um, Mark Ruffalo. You and Sting. Yeah. yeah and so we showed up and we like, <laughs> we're here, you know. <laughs> And, yeah, thank and, God. You're I know, here. thank God, right? And they say, okay, <laughs> so we're gonna put you in the in the VIP section. I'm like, that's good because you know I'm a very big person. <laughs> they walk my butt. That's right to the back. Half a back. mile. <laughs> we like passing all kind of. I want you to know, I had nothing to do Native with Native Americans. <laughs> I mean, like we, I'm like, who was all these people? And they really put the. It was a people's climate that's march right. for real. I give them a round of applause. It was unreal. They put the celebrities in the back. They didn't care. That's the new politics right there. That's the new politics. You, you still got good media coverage, though. Yeah, I do. <laughs> still, you still, uh, so, I mean, I just at, and wrap up by, um, by, I guess, touching on something John Powell says that I love John Powell, and I know he's going to join he's your coming. class in yes. a couple of weeks as an urban planning student. Um, you know, I, I touched on a lot of the work that he did in regionalism and, and structural racism. How do you dismantle structural racism, this, this thing that seems impossible to tackle? And he reminds us that the root of tackling that problem is in collective action, in, in expansive notions of belonging in a society, and that it requires imagination and spirit. And Van, I know you no shortage of the, that, both of those things. So I know I have great hope for, for the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're going to jump in, or? Well, I just want to. Or I can pose a question. Based. Uh, okay. yeah. you, you can ask a question. Sorry. <laughs> Julia, is not posing a question. Oh, let me pose a question. <laughs> I mean, what's 
I'm going to change the questions. Um, because I think this whole issue, I mean, part of what we were hoping to have in this larger dialogue and with the class itself is this conversation about how do you advance a racial and social justice agenda using policy. And I think, you know, Anna, you did, you're, you're so laser focused on institutional racism has to be named, has to be at the forefront. And I'm curious, Van, as to knowing that your whole career has been around these issues of race and class and justice and all of these important things. But you've done it from outside, inside, sideways, backwards, upside down, hiding in the corner, jumping out, angry, happy, inspiring. <laughs> um, and I'm curious now as to, and, and especially in response to Anna's naming of mm -hmm. you have to lead with that, how do you, what, how do you think we should be doing that? And yeah. in what, what angle should we be yeah. attacking this? Look, I think a couple of things. One, people say, you know, should you lead with race, be explicit about race, or should you find clever ways to get to racial justice without really leading with it? And I say, yes. See? This either or thing doesn't make sense. You need some people who are gonna be explicit about it, you need some people who are not. We've always said that. You need some people who are gonna beat you over the head with it, you need some people who are gonna smile and make it funny, and you need some people who are gonna, I mean, th this idea that we're gonna monocrop the movement that, and, and, and then spend a whole bunch of time policing ourselves as to, well, you're doing it wrong, is the stupidest way to have no power and no fun that you could come up with. I think it's great, whenever somebody, listen, whenever somebody jumps up and down and starts screaming about you know, racism, and call, like, I get very happy because it makes my job a lot easier. Period. It's a lot easier for me to come forward with solutions when the problem's been identified clearly. That division of labor should be explicit. Reverend Jesse Jackson, everybody likes to put down and kick around and treat like shit. And, and I tell you what, I'm a southerner and there's nothing worse in my culture than an ingrate, somebody who's not grateful. Uh, Reverend Jackson, through the 80s and the 90s, was a, one of the few people who was actually out there fighting some of these fights. One of the, one of the first black uh, heterosexual preachers to come out hard for gay rights, hard against AIDS phobia, which was destroying the black community. This is somebody who was there. He went down to Silicon Valley, and he started kicking them in the butt and telling them, you've got to release your numbers. And the numbers came out, the diversity numbers were horrible, and that opened the door for everybody else to come in with solutions. But had he not gone down there and been explicit and said, I'm talking about race, I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about these specific things, and I'm not going to back down, then the rest of us coming in with all our happy talk would have no place to go. So this division of labor is the only way to get anything done. Now, now, I will say, having said that, where it gets tight, where the pinch point happens, is a spiritual thing. I used to be the, I was so terrible. She knew me when I was terrible. I was the worst person you could possibly imagine dealing with in politics. I, my nickname in law school was Black Napalm. You truly can't make that up. Uh, <laughs> really? They, 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 oh, here comes Black Napalm. Because I was just destroy people. I was angry. Uh, and, you know, people would say crazy racist stuff in class or wherever. That never happens to you guys. <laughs> and then I would start, you know, explaining them how bigoted they are and how racist they are and how horrible they are. And then sometimes they would start crying. <laughs> that never happens to you. And so you have these people, you know, crying in class because I've called them a racist or whatever. And then the professor would be looking at, and, you know, when you make somebody cry in class, you know, people look at you like you got like, like a, a booger, you know. Just... <laughs> and so, you know, Omo, I would just have to raise my hand. And the professor would see me raising my hand. The professor would say, Mr. Jones, 
Is there something you'd like to say to the class? Yes, sir, there is. Everybody go, oh, okay. And I would say, your tears don't move me. My people have been crying for 400 years. Your tears do not move me. My people have been crying for 400 years, and when you get finished crying, your comment was still bigoted. Thank you. <laughs> this is before therapy. See, I was, I was, I was horrible. So I understand. I just know that no, I take, I take no backseat to anybody about the effectiveness and sometimes utility of completely unsheathed, unapologetic black rage. I did it for 10 years and burned out. And was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and had to go get a bunch of therapy and help. I'm not telling you what you should do, but I have to tell you what I can do. I can't do that no more. I just can't. I had to find some other way to be useful. And for me, not strategy, not philosophy, just biography, for me, I got so good at uh, telling you what I was against and defining what I was against that what I was against was defining me. I was anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-poverty, anti-war. You took those anti, I didn't know who I was, except somebody who was anti a whole bunch of shit. And for me, this is not theory, this is biography. For me, I had to get some healing. And I had to come to a place where I realized I could deconstruct everything. I was a theoretical genius, Marxist intellectual par excellence, I don't apologize for it, and I could deconstruct everything and I couldn't reconstruct anything. And every time I came forward with a positive idea, I would tear it apart in my own mind before I get out of my mouth. And if I could get it out of my mouth, my friends would tear it apart. And so the only thing we could do was protest and work with very young people, very poor people, and intellectuals. We couldn't work with any other part of society. Very young people, very poor people, intellectuals. Nobody, everybody else we had a critique of, labor critique of, Democrats critique, we couldn't, we couldn't move. I couldn't live that way. So what I will say now to move on is that we have to be as sophisticated as the systems we're trying to change, which means people got to be able to do their thing. People got to be able to do what they're good at. It can't be it all must be this way and then everything that's not this way is some sellout nonsense because all that does is monocrop the movement and there's a difference now, Omo, you tell me if I'm wrong. By the way, we got one of the biggest, most important uh, leaders, organizers, teachers, a quiet force. Omo Wally's right there. Just give his brother a round. You all know who he is, but give him a round of applause. <laughs> Omo Wally Satterite, right, right here. <laughs> brother Omo, I believe, and I believe I take from your teaching, that there's a difference between a political subculture and a political movement. That's my language. Political subculture is very interested in policing itself. It's very interesting in making sure that you know, who's in, who's out, who's real, who's fake. It's just like uh, skateboarders, yep. right? Skateboarders like that. Well, you ain't no real thrasher. <laughs> the difference is skateboarders ain't promising to deliver no good stuff for the world. Subculture is always trying to police itself and not bad, mad about being small. In fact, if it gets too big, they'll split off. A movement's trying to grow every day. A movement's trying to get more power every day, more allies every day, more converts every day. A movement's trying, uh, Mandela says, don't prepare to protest, prepare to govern. Govern yourself, govern your organization, govern your community, take responsibility. Those are very different ways of being. I know because I've, I've lived both ways. And so I just want to say, I'm happy to be misunderstood. Listen, there's an article, and I'll give it back to you. There's an article in the, in the, in the Huffington Post today about me hugging Holden, uh, the Koch brothers' attorney. Uh, it was weird. 
Uh, you're having remorse, you're feeling. No, <laughs> no. He's just like sitting in the moment. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, even at the time, it was like, 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 I can tell he's like, this is weird. <laughs> and I think to myself, this is weird. But it was important. Because I had my people there, he had his people there. We don't agree on anything. Listen, and in case anybody misses the irony here, because some of you guys don't know who I am. The Koch brothers funded AFP to take me out the White House. Just in case anybody missed the, the joke. Americans for Prosperity, funded by the Koch brothers, they're the ones that came after me to get me out of the White House. So I'm literally standing with the guy who wrote the check that destroyed my White House job. And I'm looking at this man in his eyes for the first time. He's looking at me in my eyes for the first time. But I'm realizing that there's a million black people and two point whatever million human beings behind bars that don't care about none of that. Mm -hmm. They don't care about none of that. Somebody somewhere has got to be able to break through all that and figure out a way to get them home. And if for whatever crazy reason the Koch brothers want to be a part of that, I don't have the right to say, you got the cooties. <laughs> and call that politics. Thank Done. You. Thank you. So we're going to start transitioning to Q&A. So there's mics in the front if folks want to ask a question of any of us up here. But I'm going to have Anna as we go into Q&A because the... I believe the mics are truly right here in the front. There's no one up here yet. Um, respond, because I think the environmental justice movement is a very interesting movement that has been very anti, anti, anti historically yeah. and because out of necessity in some part. So I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, no, to, I agree. Yeah. I think that um, I think the movement has had to evolve, you know, and, and figure out a strategy out of that constant defensive uh, mechanisms that they built up. Um, otherwise, they were going to get you know, left behind, isolated, increasingly ineffective. So I think that they're a relatively, it's a relatively young movement. We're learning. We're learning how to build bridges. We're learning that, and out of necessity, too, that it, has to, it can't be done just by the frontline communities. We have to extend that notion of care and ethic of responsibility way beyond the sacrifice zones if we ever have any hope of redemption in our communities. So, you know, we used to give toxic tours. You know, we did it with folks in our communities and realized our communities have to start giving these tours to people in the suburbs. Like here, you, you need to be allies with us. We will not solve the problems here without you all being part of the solution because many of the problems go extend beyond us. And I think there's also a moment of reflection on you know, I think the point of reflecting on the institutional racism, particularly in the academic setting with young people who are preparing to be practitioners in the world, is to help them not just get really good at the critique, because you know, that is important to know and see and be aware in the world, but also to figure out ways and tools to use that self-awareness and that critique um, for their own agency. And wherever the world they find themselves in, whether it's the private, the public, the movement sectors, that they find themselves able to act with their own agency and their own discretion um, to use what they know and that critique uh, to shine light, you know, to, to continue the work in whatever way they think uh, is meaningful to them as well. So I don't want it to cripple them, you know, whenever they learn about institutional racism, the point is not to feel bad and to go sulk and forget about it and, or, you know, just feel powerless. Sometimes we get frozen by that, the, the notion of something so big. Uh, but it's actually to empower them, to help them find their own way in the world to, to speak truth to power and to use their discretion. So. Thank you, thank you. And so now we'll open it up to the first question. How much time we got? We have about 12 minutes. That's like half, that's like a, that's a question, one question. For <laughs> no, I'm gonna grab your mic, mic my friend. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Dorit Avganim. I'm a nonprofit management student here. Thank you all for your time and your uh, expertise and your eloquent voices. Uh, curious when you talk about creating jobs and creating this 100,000 person pool of talented, trade-ready professionals, 
what your thoughts are on keeping those jobs here in America. You know, should there be that hundred, that million person opportunity? How do we keep those opportunities here in time to train those professionals? So you want to take a couple? Yeah, wanna, we'll take a couple. Why don't, why don't That's good. Listen to a couple of questions and then we'll cool. take turns. Yeah, I think mine's things. along the same lines. So. One of the things that I, one of the big bridges, so I'm Ryan, I met you earlier on the, sub, or on the elevator, um, though I've seen you a bunch of times. <laughs> um, so one of the bridges that I've worked as a community organizer and been involved in environmental justice movements, mostly in West Virginia um, with mountaintop removal, et cetera, um, but I've also worked for some other organizations that you, Sierra Club, Rainforest Action Network. 350, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, here we go. We know that so, you're qualified to ask a question. Yeah, go. great, great. So I've, one of the things that I've noticed is there's this real funding gap that happens with um, grassroots organizations and big orgs and also foundations and governments. There's there's like the all the funding that comes out or a lot of it is conditional, highly, highly conditional, super strings attached. And I just see that a lot of really brilliant organizations have such powerful limitations on what they're able to do. And if, if they get a blank check, they have a lot more capability. So I'm just wondering, I, I'm, I'm sort of new to this sort of thinking. I just took a job with a medium-sized foundation and this is a lot of the conversation happening inside. So I'm new to this conversation, but I know, I know that getting money to these grassroots organizations, some of which I've worked with, is really important. I'm just wondering, advancing my knowledge and then just wondering if there's a conversation about that. And I also understand the strong reasons why blank checks are, uh, uh, big funders hesitate to write blank checks. There's plenty of good reasons and bad reasons to not write blank checks. So that's my thought slash question. Hi, um, I'm Melanie Steinhardt, um, and I'm very interested, you and Anna both spoke about uh, the need for those most affected by the problem to have a voice in the solution, and I'm particularly interested in that in terms of your commendable goal to cut the prison population in half. And I'm wondering if you've reached out at all to Just Leadership USA, an organization founded by formerly incarcerated people with the goal of cutting the prison population in half by putting formerly incarcerated people at the forefront of policy reform and advocacy. Hi, my question is a little bit similar to Melanie's. I'm Dinah, and my question is, are there any formerly incarcerated people involved in the movement? Um, it's a great movement to cut the prison population in half, so I just wanna know, I mean, you know, it's, it's those closest to the problem that have the solution. Hi, my, na oh. my name's Talani. I, I'm reading a question from the live streamers. They're asking about climate change and whether it is easier or better to concentrate um, climate change issues at a state and that, uh, excuse me, a city and national, uh, excuse, sorry, a city and state level as opposed to a national level. Hi, my name is Michael Miner. Um, I'm actually more on the sociologist perspective. Um, so uh, we have a, we talk a lot about race, um, but what I feel like we don't talk a lot about is money. Um, now, intersectionalist theory would say that we can't really separate the two. Um, so why don't we talk about it more? Why don't we talk about the rich black man versus the poor black man versus the poor white man versus the rich black man? Hi. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I'm Alexis Mena, an educator. and. Um, Brooklyn schools, and my question is, is, what is your advice to young organizers like myself <clears throat> that want to build towards that uh, political movement you spoke about earlier, but uh, when working with an entire generation of youth that have feel like they've been forgotten or left behind or criminalized by the same system, how do you work with them? So I think what might make sense just based on time is there are a set of questions. Folks should just, we'll just answer which ones we want to as we go down. So, Van, you want to go first? Or are you going to be the longest? Okay. Come on. So, Van, if you're going to be the longest, you don't go first. <laughs> I'm going to keep this short. <laughs> I mean, some of these, um, the funding and philanthropy, I mean, y'all should talk to Michelle DePaz <laughs> and Van, who has a lot more experience in this. Uh, but I, I, I do see, uh, again, uh, going back to the issue of building bigger alliances and coalitions. You know, I think part of the the uh, solution is you know, learning how to share, <laughs> too, because um, you know, the pie's only gonna get so big 
And, you know, if we can align our movements in meaningful ways and substantive ways, it makes it um, certainly um, a different kind of funding strategy that can occur if groups open that up. Um, so it's, but it's tricky. And I, you know, I don't have, if I had the answer to that, I would have done a much better job in Newark <laughs> on the ground. But it's a difficult problem to tackle. Um, Let's see, a climate change, uh, you know, state versus national solutions. Honestly, we, we need both, particularly with the, the carbon, uh, the clean power plan that's come out of the EPA, which really pushes uh, implementation to the states. Um, and in many ways, uh, a lot of folks have been raising alarms about what that means because we know how different states like to implement <laughs> Uh, federal mandates, and they do it very differently. And so um, there needs to be a push both uh, from the local level up and also at the national level to, for accountability across the country. Um, because, you know, what will often happen is the devolution process results in a dilution process. And we need to, um, you know, hold, hold accountable those folks um, at the, the national level um, to make to continue to make changes because those national commitments then also translate to international commitments that we need to make. So um, both, so it's kind of a easy yes. And then the young organizer, I'll just finish with that and let Van um, answer, um, you know, I work with young organizers um, and young people in Newark um, in the EJ movement um, and I think Part of uh, what I see sometimes is that we don't make room. We want young people to join the movement. We don't necessarily give room for them to lead um, and to get the experience in, in being in, in the front. And um, so I, I feel like we also need to learn how to um, evolve and transition and make those paths possible for young people to not just be part of something but to lead and be at the front of something and innovate, use their creativity and their innovation, you know, um, and not stifle them, so. And I'm gonna, as the moderator, jump in. Um, you know, I think the question about the jobs and jobs staying local, and especially in the context of the jobs that, I'll let Van talk about the computer coding jobs, but what I think is interesting is that we really should be doing an intentional look across the sectors of where there are good paying jobs that you know, a breadth of our folks can actually get into that provide careers. And so, you know, I work at the water, in my day job, I work at the water department in San Francisco and having done social justice work and EJ work for most of my career, transitioning into the public sector has been qu quite a journey, but I think that the scale of impact there is huge and that if you look at utilities across the country, all of them are having conversations about the retirement issues that are up upon them. And so, for example, we have 2,300 employees in San Francisco. 40% of them are eligible for retirement in the next five years. And it makes sense. They all came in during the Clean Water Act. They're all old. They're all white. They're all men. I mean, and I like a lot of them. No critique. But it is a huge opportunity. And again, I think as we think about opportunities, that we've done a scan of the 30 largest utilities in the country. It's facing Philly, Chicago, Washington, D.C., L.A., um, Camden are all having these same conversations. And these are jobs where you, you can come out of high school, it's not all engineering jobs, they have a pension, and they're interesting. So I'm always talking to kids of like, if you, if you like scandal, we have a whole squad of policy people that are looking at City Hall and maneuvering how do we deal with PG&E. Scandal, I like that. Right? Right? <laughs> or if you like Facebook, we have 22 people in our communications team that just do communications work. Or if you like the outdoors, we're the biggest landowner in San Francisco, in Alameda. You, we have people that just go out there and watch the land and make sure all that stuff happens. So. <laughs> All that to say is that I think that as you're looking at local opportunities, there's, there's plenty of ways for us to think about that. Um, the whole money to grassroots organizations, which I can't see the person, but that question in particular, I think that the whole paradigm of foundations and funding groups needs to be thought, rethought. And I think, um, again, like at the public sector, we put more money into the arts than our local foundations do because we're required by the city charter. So all of our construction, we do billions of dollars in construction. 2% of all that has to go into our art. And so again, it's like we're putting more in than foundations, but the mindset of community-based organizations, they don't partner with us typically. Yet, if I had known when I was running Urban Habitat or you had known when you were running Ella Baker Center, it's just like all money is not bad money. You can partner with the public sector. They, you don't have to go to convenings every five minutes, which is nice. 
And the money is way bigger. And so my advice to nonprofits is to really look at kind of how do you partner in the public, with the public sector and add the value. Like we need to figure out how to do outreach in monolingual Spanish communities in San Francisco. We, sh we are, have now started a community benefits process where we're supporting local grassroots organizing groups that have that base and are just funding them and saying, we just want access to your young people five times a year to talk to them about our issues or survey them, et cetera. And so it's been a really interesting piece. And then around the, the last question around the young organizers and hope, I see you because you're right in the middle. Um, I mean, I just think the time is so exciting right now. And I know folks in the last conversation that we just had left there a little bit feeling kind of hopeless. And when you, when you hear about these issues, it can make you frozen and that type of thing. But I, I mean, where I see it is there's nothing but opportunity because when we were younger and going in, it was like our one track was to go into the nonprofit sector to do this work. And it really was this outside strategy. And now I feel like the sky's the limit. When you look at kind of, we have folks that are going totally private sector to move this agenda. You've got folks going on the public sector. You have folks that are doing the nonprofit organizing if that's really where your passion is and we need folks out there. You have folks that are doing stuff with the tech. And, I mean, the possibilities are endless right now as we think about it. And it's so solutions driven, which is the fun part. It's like the what the issues are, I think a lot of us know them and name them, and that's the heavy part. But being able to imagine and envision of how do you do the heavy lift to, to get us out of this mess is what I think is upon us. So I would just encourage, encourage folks to keep doing this fight. Dan? Good. <laughs> it's good to be here with you. I know. I know, it's kind of crazy. We, we were kids together in the Bay Area, and now you're like, yeah, see, since I'm running the utilities, I'm like, I'm like that's amazing. I mean, it really is. Um, so, I mean, a couple things. Um, big picture, we probably aren't going to agree on analysis of the problem at any large scale. There's a myth that you have to. You look at the civil rights movement, and in the height of the civil rights movement, there was just massive disagreement between the black nationalists and the black Muslims and the civil rights folks and the, and the Urban League pro-business people and uh, the Black Panthers who wanted to go to the armed struggle. I mean, like, at the height of the civil rights movement, which we imagine was like this moment of, like, you know, unity and common purpose, if you read the actual, what's going on, it just looked like pandemonium at the, from the inside at the time. So to the extent that people feel like they've got to all agree on the problem description, I think you wind up feeling more frustrated. What's amazing is how much agreement there is emerging on the solution side. Um, people won't, uh, I don't believe it's about racism, but I do think, I mean, uh, what was it, Wisconsin just passed a law that says you, if the police officer kills somebody, you have to have an outside investigator. Now, they don't, that, the case that sparked it wasn't even a, a racial case. It was a white dude killed by a white cop. But there's some agreement on that. So I just want to point that out that, uh, you know, let, let the Marxists be Marxists, let the feminists be, let everybody have their own thing and can have the debate, but don't let that stop you from, from being able to move stuff forward. Now, with the questions in particular, um, my friends asked me about formerly incarcerated people in the movement. Where, where, where did my friends go? Did y'all leave already? Good. So are you, are you uh, uh, formerly incarcerated, both of, either of you? No, but we work with formerly incarcerated people. Okay. I, 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 honest question. I was just trying to figure out if, if, if that's, okay. So, um, uh, so Cut 50 is led by two people. One is Shaka Senghor. And I, I could just sit here and talk about Shaka all day. He did 20 years in prison for murder uh, as part of gang-related uh, activity. Seven years solitary confinement. Um, and somehow transformed himself into the most extraordinary person I've ever met. Uh, he's now a fellow at MIT. Uh, his uh, TED talk uh, and because it's a felon, they wouldn't even let him into the country, into Canada. They, the TED was happening in Canada. They wouldn't even let him out of the country. So he did a TED talk that, even though he wasn't at the conference, has now got a million views and growing. Um, extraordinary guy. He's one of the leaders of, of the Cut 50 campaign. Jessica Jackson is the other uh, young, white, uh, blonde, southerner uh, whose husband got messed up on meth. They went to court to turn him in, uh, 
expecting to get help, he got seven years in prison. So you have this African-American man in this like Southern Belle, um, and they are unstoppable and unbelievable, and I learn from them every day. That said, sometimes there's an energy in our movement that's a kind of who are you to be doing that energy? And I just raise it because I think it's sometimes holds us back. I think that there's, we can accidentally create an environment where people feel like, if I say something, I'm gonna be smacked down. Or if, if I'm not a left-handed, you, know, you go down the whole list of all the different kinds of isms and, and, and bigotries and biases, that I just am not qualified to speak and I shouldn't do anything. And that's not the intention, but it's something as we get wiser, we have to figure out some way to, to manage. I don't know how to do it. Um, so I could have been sitting here with an intention to help close the prison population without having two people whose lives have been destroyed by the criminal justice system on my team. And then I wouldn't have the cheap move of being able to say, well, there's Jessica and Chaka. So I want to say, I can do the cheap move, appoint a Jessica and Chaka, and get out of it, but I don't want to. What I want to say is, even though I have Jessica and Chaka, and they have me, if we didn't have each other, I would still be in this fight. And I would be as loud and belligerent and obnoxious about it, uh, and make mistakes and learn every day. And we've got to figure out some way, which brings me to my favorite brother. Who was that dude asking about the black, rich, white person versus the poor white person? <laughs> Who was you? What's your name? What? Michael? Michael, you got some cojones, man. I almost cussed you out. I'm like, what the heck? But that's beautiful. That's a, that's a good question. I was, ooh, I was feeling constipated. I was like, I got the constipated face. And I love that because you're not supposed to, look, I'm going to tell you right now in case nobody give you the memo. White dudes ain't supposed to come up here and say stuff like that. You're just supposed to be happy to be here and <laughs> try not to get beat up. So the fact that you didn't get that memo is the best thing that's happened. I'm like, wow, that's, man, I wouldn't have, ooh. And so that's good. Um, I don't have a great answer to that question. I think it's uncomfortable. I think it's uncomfortable. Uh, I think there's a fear that, if you, that, that the reason that you did what you did is because you don't want to deal with racism. That would be my projection onto you. I would dismiss you, I would assassinate you in my mind. I would just say, see this cracker boy up here, right? That's, that's, that's the mental talk. Don't want to deal with racism, so he wants to jump over to class where he's more comfortable. He, he wants to jump over to income where he can have a place where he can still be in charge and he doesn't have to deal with my thing. And so then we would, so then I might stand up and say it nice, but in my mind I would be mentally assassinating you and hating you without even knowing you or knowing your motivation. So the reason I, 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 lo I love you and I love, you, love what you said is because it's uncomfortable. And it could be that you're 99% just a dude up to no good trying to undermine racial struggle and progress. But even if you're 1% right, I need to deal with that. So I'm gonna deal with that. I don't have an answer for you right now, but I'm gonna deal with that. Now what else? Um, climate change. Can we please start saying state, local, and tribal? Right, I, just, I, just, I, just, I think it's important. Um, because we leave out the whole history of this place when we act like it's only three levels of government. It's really, it's, it's, it's federal, state, local, and tribal. There are sovereign tribal people here. Um, and so, and then to answer your question, yes, I do think that right now, fighting for these campus-based struggles around divestment, fighting for, which is a kind of a local struggle, uh, fighting for uh, 
uh, climate policy at the local level, these utility companies setting uh, renewable energy standards, these state governments that can set up uh, carbon trading schemes or carbon fees or whatever you want to do, I think that's going to be more profitable for now. And the reality is if we can have one, two, three, you already have Reggie on the East Coast, if you can have one, two, three, five, twelve Californias, you'll force the federal government to move. And when the federal government moves, then everybody else will move. And by the way, China just shocked the world last week by announcing their own cap and trade program. So you, between China and the EU, we're going to now be left behind in our own thing. So anyway, so that's, that's one. And then the last thing that I'll get to the jobs. is the jobs thing. So yeah, so look. Y'all have to know when you see people like me and Simone doing stuff. That what we're doing is kind of what we're doing, but it's kind of not really what we're doing because we're probably doing something else too, right? <laughs> Simone's like, don't tell them our secret. Right. So here's, our, open, here's our, our secret, which we tell everybody. This tech thing is not about jobs. way deeper than that, way deeper. Um, we will figure out a way to keep those, look, there's a million worker shortage, the best thing that you'd be able to do is maybe be able to get 400,000 of them brought from outside, you still have 600,000. We'll figure that out. But I think you're gonna have so much more demand for those jobs, you could have immigration and education. You could have a smart immigration policy to bring some tech workers here, and still have a massive education thing. So we don't have to fight over that. Um, but that's too narrow. Here's the problem. This is not an economic problem only. It's a democracy problem. The future is not being written anymore in laws in Washington, D.C. The future is being written in code in Silicon Valley. The future is being written in code in Silicon Valley. That's where the apps and the drones and the smart screens and all that stuff is being created and imagined and designed and unleashed on the world and the demographic is lily white. You have a very small number of mostly male, mostly young, mostly white, mostly educated people essentially designing the world in their image. And you download their ideas every day on your, on your smartphone. If you do not equip the majority of people with the tools and the training and the technology to build a future that works for them, the future will not work for them. So you have to democratize technology education. You have to give folks in Newark, Oakland, the ability to see a problem and begin to design a, their own future. Part of our problem is we still try to get big states and governments and big corporate elites to do what we want them to do. How's that working? We gotta keep at it because we're, it's, it's a real thing. But we've done hackathons where we've got young people of color in Philadelphia, in Oakland, in New Orleans, et cetera, in the room with folks from Google, Facebook, top engineers. And as I told the class earlier, the top engineers at Google and Facebook's minds were blown by how brilliant these kids are. And they started designing their own apps. And their apps were unreal because they have problems that are unreal. So with, once they had the tools, they started coming up with their own solutions. I'll close with this, some of their solutions. Some kids in Oakland said, we want to make an app that will remind us of when our court dates are. He said, what? Say, listen, all kids do drugs and do stuff, but the suburban kids are in their daddy's basement. They don't get arrested. 
We do the same thing they do. We're on the street corner. We get popped. That's not the problem. The problem is they give us a piece of paper. Paper says March 19th at 3.30, be in this building, in this section, for your hearing. And they lose a piece of paper. By the time they get to court, the judge is pissed. You're non-compliant. So they wind up, a little bit of problem winds up being a whole lot of time. They said, can't there be an app for that? <laughs> so they built it. We had a young girl down in uh, New Orleans, foster care girl. She said, we don't have parents. They don't give much money to the foster parents, so our clothes are all hand-me-down. They're, 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 they're donated. And, and when we wear them, the students laugh at us. So some girls will do things you wouldn't want your girl doing just to get money to buy clothes so we don't get laughed at. She said, couldn't there be an app where when people donate the clothes, they just take a picture of the clothes. And then we could look and find clothes we want and let folks know. There was somebody in the room who said that could be a billion dollar idea sitting in that girl's head. Because it's a global industry of secondhand clothes. Billion dollar idea sitting there in that young girl's head. This technology thing is not just about getting a job. It could also be about creating your own company and giving a job. And if you don't care about getting or giving a job, it could be about solving problems faster than governments or corporate elites will even consider the problem. So I say this to say, we don't know who the next Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg is in terms of having some home run billion dollar company. But we do know that one out of every five kids of any color has the mental aptitude to become a computer programmer. They've tested, one out of five. Has the mental aptitude, the, 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 the pattern recognition, Omo, the, 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 the problem-solving tenacity to be a computer coder. One out of five. Not one out of five could be LeBron James. They're not gonna, ha they're not gonna have a million basketball players in America. Not one out of five can be Jay-Z. The record label is not going to sign a million rappers. That's not going to happen. But there will be a million people who right now don't know how to code, who are coding. Them getting a job is the least of our agenda. Once they get that job and they've got the ability and the training and the technology, we have no idea what problems that they're going to solve. And that's what Yes We Code is really all about. So thank you. Fantastic. Can we give our guests one more round of applause? Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank those of you that we had a couple of hundred people, I think, on the live stream. This is an important conversation that we will be continuing all semester, where the next uh, guest public lecture we have is Manuel Pastor, and <laughs> another Californian. <laughs> but I want to thank Anna Baptista, who's one of ours at Milano. Thank you, Anna. Thank Juliet Ellis and Derek Hamilton who've gone this journey to put together this class. And thank Executive Dean Mary Watson for your support in making all this happen. And thank the students in the class and my friends who have been supportive in this journey. Applause yourself. And finally, to thank Van Jones. Have a good night, everyone.